Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the first International Symposium of Earth, Energy, Environmental Science, and Sustainable Development 2020 in School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia. This event covers numerous subjects, ranging from the broad earth science, 
energy and environmental science to more specific topics on sustainable development goals and the special issues of coronavirus disease 2019 and community engagement for better environment. This symposium delightedly invites all interested national and international experts and enthusiasts from universities, institutions, organizations, businesses, and the communities themselves. Hosted virtually by Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development and School of Environmental Science has the honor to present you this international symposium. This symposium is presented by the committee which has nurtured the virtuous culture of collective values and the vibrant youth spirits of the School of Environmental Science. Now, we will continue to the next session. However, before we move further to the next agenda, the committee would like to thank our general sponsor of the first international symposium of Earth, Energy, Environmental Science, and Sustainable Development 2020, Bank Rakyat Indonesia, Unilever, and Starborn. To all participants, please fill in the attendance link listed on the chat box. And also, if you have any question, you can fill the question form the link listed on the chat box. We are now continuing our meeting to the next agenda, that is to hear the keynote speeches which will be delivered by Nurdiana Darus from Head of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability Unilever Indonesia, Dr. Insinyur Haruki Agustina M. and S.C., Director for Contamination Recovery and Emergency Response of Hazardous Waste Ministry of Environment and Forestry, and Dr. Yuki M. A. Wardana, School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia, and Indonesia Infrastructure Guarantee Fund, IIGF, or PT Penjaminan Infrastruktur Indonesia Persero. The keynote speech will be moderated by Dr. Ayahuddin Sodri, Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development, School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia. Dr. Ayahuddin Sodri is a lecturer at the School of Environmental Science 2018, Universitas Indonesia. He teaches the courses of Sustainable Development Planning, Environmental Modeling, Food, Water, Energy Nexus, and Writing Scientific Research Manuscript. He acts as a managing editor of the journal Environmental Science and Sustainable Development, GESSD. He holds a doctoral degree in Environmental Science from Universitas Indonesia, 2017, by defending his dissertation titled A Dynamic Model of Economic Growth, Mobility and Transportation Energy Towards Low Carbon Cities. His research interest is focused to environmental modeling, human energy environment, food energy water nexus, and sustainable production and consumption. He has a particular interest in system dynamics and life cycle cost analysis, LCCA. He is also a lecturer at graduate program in biomedical engineering, electrical engineering department, Universitas Indonesia 2010. To Dr. Ayahuddin Sodri, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Putri. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Selamat siang. Uh, it's my honor to be a moderator for this uh, very remarkable event. Although we are all on the difficult situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, therefore, first I would like to express my condolence to all of the victims of COVID-19 around the globe. I also want to express my high appreciation to the medical and non-medical team who is helping the patient for surviving from the COVID-19 attack. Uh, last but not the least, we appreciate government, organization, and society who hand on hand in this critical pandemic situation. May I request you to pray that the pandemic disaster will be overcome soon. Amen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this session is the third session of our conference. It would be focused uh, as a recent talk on waste management in Indonesia, and especially to discuss about the barrier and opportunities. 
for your information, this GESD symposium is getting high attention from many researcher, student, professional, and policymaker. More than 250 papers submitted for this conference. Thank you very much. And more than 30 nationalities participate as the authors, reviewer, speaker, and audience. The first day conference yesterday and the second plenary session this morning were very successfully getting, getting attention from many participants during the plenary session as well as parallel session. Therefore, we would like to appreciate all of you who contribute to this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, for the current session, there are three prominent speakers who will share their knowledge and expertise in this research talk. The first is Mrs. Nurdiana Darus, Head of Corporate Affairs and Sustainability, Unilever Indonesia. Uh, second is Dr. Haruki Agustina, Director for Contamination Recovery and Emergency Response of Hazardous Waste from the Ministry of uh, Environment and Forestry. And the third speaker is uh, Dr. Yuki uh, Wardana from the School of Environmental Science, University of Indonesia, and from the Indonesian Infrastructure Guarantee Fund. On the behalf of Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development and School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia, we would like to express our high appreciation for all speakers who are coming to our conference today. We want also to express our thanks to all participants who are attending this virtual conference from around the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand uh, over this to the uh, first speaker, may I introduce you the short biography of Mrs. Nurdiana Darus. Currently, she is a head of corporate affairs and sustainability at uh, Unilever Indonesia. She is an executive with over 23 years of strategic program development and implementation experience, advocacy and grassroots work, as well as operation management and stakeholder relation. Her current role is engaged in advocacy work with stakeholders in the palm oil, plastic, and other sustainability initiatives. She has an ample experience in the consulting sector, in the private sector, as a, a senior government official and leadership role in civil society organization. She has excellence in project implementation, change, communication, and stakeholder management. Uh, previously, she served as the Chief Operating Officer for Landscape Indonesia and prior to that as the Director for Southeast Asia for South, so excuse me, for Southeast Asia of the Rainforest Alliance where she, Alliance, where she lead strategic planning, fundraising, and implementation of sustainable forestry, agricultural, and climate program. She received a cum laude bachelor degree in business admin, administration majoring in management information system from the University of Oklahoma, master of science degree in information system technology from the George Washington University, and executive training from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University and the Edmund Walsh School of Origin Service at Georgetown University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mrs. Nurdiana Darus. Mrs. Nurdiana Darus, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bapak Dr. Ahya Yudin. Um, I am very grateful for the long introduction. Uh, <laughs> Just to make sure. Long, I should, I should, next time I should really shorten it so it's, it doesn't become, it doesn't take so much time. But uh, um, thank you very much for having me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Bapak Bapak Ibu Ibu sekalian. Usually I'm usually called by my friends, Dr. Ayyuddin, uh, by Ade really. Uh, hardly anybody really calls me Nurdiana Darus these days. Most people actually know me by Nurdiana, by Ade Darus, even in the in Unilever as well. So thank you and thank you for everybody who has raised an interest in this session. Um, we have, um, 20 minutes, I think, to share our findings of this research that we are very proud to have commissioned 
and our partnerships with our three partners um, uh, to really uncover what we feel is really, really an important issue and important not just to the environmental, but also our future um, sustainability of the country and of the well-being of the country as well. So um, I'd like to share the presentation. If I could ask my colleague to um, share the screen. Um, Mbak Ade, this is Muftazar. I already share my screen. Can you yeah. put it on uh, slide mode, please, Tazar? Okay. Yeah, it's not coming up, Tazar. Slide mode? Yes, already okay. done, Mbak Ade. Okay, sorry. I think there's just a technical delay as we all experience these days with the technology. Thank you so much. So the research that we've conducted um, late last year into early this year, just before COVID, uh, it's titled An Overview of Plastic Waste Recycling in the Urban Areas of Java in Indonesia. Next slide. I like to emphasize first and foremost though, that this um, study was actually conducted from uh, the angle that it would benefit, not just the country, but also, but also benefit Unilever as a business, as a corporation that does have a lot of our products in actual packaging, plastic packaging uh, um, specifically. So this is a, the end in mind of this study was really twofold. One is to really understand the baseline that, that we work in, in terms of the plastic management issue, plastic waste management issue to be exact. And also to uncover the potentials of what we can as a country take this and work on the issues and treat them as challenges for the potentials of not just Java alone, but also for the country. So let me just start why it's important for Unilever to have actually commissioned this, this study. It is, plastic is one of the most important packaging materials for consumers, goods manufacturers, such as Unilever. Um, it's lightweight, it is durable, and at the same time, it can protect the products that, that we sell. It, it, gives, it keeps them very safe, but it also makes it very affordable for the consumers to actually purchase these products. Our product um, comprise of health and hygiene products, beauty products, but also food and refreshments as well. So to us, plastic is very, very critical as a very uh, important material so that we can ensure that our consumers can enjoy our products, but also feel safe while they're actually using these products. But of course, mismanagement of plastic waste is an issue, not just in Indonesia, but globally as well. And often we forget that this, this material that can give us so much value, so much protection, but if it's mismanaged, it can actually have really detrimental impact for our environment, but also, and also uh, in, the, in the long run to our health and well-being as well. Therefore, Unilever globally has set new ambitious commitments for a waste-free world by 2025. Essentially, the three commitments that we've made globally is one is half the use of our virgin plastic by reducing absolute number of plastic packaging by more than 100,000 tons. This is globally. And also, of course, accelerating the use of recycled plastic. But we are also to commit to transform our packaging to make sure that there are 100% of our packaging will be reusable, recyclable, or compostable. And lastly, we help and collect and process more plastic packaging than we sell. And so to achieve this commitment, we feel that the existing studies, the existing literature is still somewhat limited. Uh, we were unable to really uncover what we really needed to understand. One is on the baseline itself where, you know, there are so many materials that needs to be understood further. The value chain of the plastic waste management system in Indonesia, but also more importantly, the potentials 
or what we can uncover, how much that we can take it to really ensure that is for the prosperity of the country as a whole. And in that sense, we really want to push for the development of circular economy um, for Indonesia and also wherever we operate. And then as many of you understand, you know, very, very uh, know very much and um, is that a lot of our plastic programs, not just our Unilever's programs, but also all the other players, the private sectors players, we have a lot of program in Surabaya and in Bali, but where else in Java? Is it really just Surabaya that we should focus on? I think we feel that there are potentials in other parts of Java. And that is why we were so uh, enthusiastic to really commission the study. Next slide, Tazar. Okay. Now, before I go further into the study itself, I would like to really thank our partners, Sustainable Waste Indonesia, Indonesian Plastic Recycler, and Ikatan Pemulung Indonesia. Uh, without them, um, this study wouldn't have been so thoroughly um, assessed, right? And this collaboration was really key to the success of the research itself, such that the, each of the organization brought critical insights to the real conditions of the plastic value chain in Indonesia. The data collection within the study is a combination of primary and secondary data collection processes. Primary data was collected from field survey, online survey, and focus group discussions, or FGDs, while the secondary data was collected through literature reviews, desktop reviews of previous studies reports, academic journals, diverse related websites, but also um, other research that we had commissions in the past as well. Surveys and interviews were conducted in the urban area of each region of Jaffa, this Western, Central, and East Jaffa, targeting collection recycling actors involved in the recyclable waste stream from upstream, middle stream, and downstream segments. A total number of 232 actors were surveyed and were interviewed, comprising of upstream, midstream, and downstream actors. Next slide, Nazar. All right. But why Java? Well, we know that 60% of our population actually you know, live in Java, right? So naturally, the plastic waste management issues is really is very huge in Java. Let's just say that 60% of our populations actually reside in the island of Java. That's 160 million. Or um, if we just calculate how many households, that would really comprise of around 40 million half households in Java alone. And if one household actually had a, at least one Unilever product in their household, that means there will be at some point in time, whether from a daily consumption or monthly consumption, around 40 million products of the Unilever products actually in the households. Now we feel that in addition to this commitment that we have glo globally, we really do feel well, the research was really, would really be a, a help in hand for us to really move the needle. Right? For us as Unilever, we drive how uh, our plastic packaging um, a business sector and the demand. And so that is where we feel that if we change the way we look at plastic, if we change our own view of how we can move from virgin use to recycled plastic use, we hope that this would really move the needle towards a more circular economy of the plastic, plastic uh, packaging. The urban population of Java generates around 189,000 tons of plastic waste on a monthly basis. Yet from this number, only shy of 12% of the plastic waste is being collected by upstream actors and waste bank Induk. The remaining 88% is either directly transported to landfill or being littered to the environment. Next slide, does it? Most of the plastics that you, we, we use on our daily basis and our daily lives um, are collected by informal sectors. Both rigid plastics, such as water bottle plastics, plastic cups, bottles of household goods, helmets, et cetera, 
and the flexible plastic types, such as the plastic film, plastic bags, and the sachets and all that. The study that we've conducted found that the most collected plastic types are rigid PP, that's at 25%, film HDPE at 20%, rigid PET at 20%, rigid HDPE at 14% and film PP at 9%. Now, if we, let's say we collected 100 kilograms of plastic, then there would be 25 kilograms of rigid PP and 20 kilograms of film HDPE and so forth. Now, what's very interesting from this finding is that there is a growing demand from, for film HDPE which is, which is um, essentially our flexibles. When previous studies, previous literatures had indicated that it was not the preferred uh, material to be collected by our waste pickers. Now, of course, this has the, the previous researchers may not ha have uncovered the growing demand um, from the businesses, but also maybe the growing demand as well by waste pickers as well to have collected all these film HDPE in the, uh, in the environment. Next slide, Tazan. Now, according to our findings, Central Java, particularly Central, uh, the Central Java region, and particularly Central Java, is the most promising. It has uh, the most potentials. Why is that? Because there's not much movement in terms of plastic, a really good plastic waste management system. But we should look at that as a business opportunity, as an opportunity for us to really improve the waste management, the plastic waste management system in that region, but as part and parcel of the entire Java itself. Now, Central Java province is the highest since it has the largest potential or the white space that we, what we, call, we like to call it, is the highest at 93.75% among the others, followed by Western Java 2, uh, Region 4, and Region 3, with 91%, 89%, 89, almost 90%, and 89.76%, um, respectively. While Eastern Java 1 that comprises of Greater Malang area should be the lowest priority, seeing that the white space proportion is the lowest in the region. Now, this is also because much of our um, recycling industry has been developed on the Eastern Java, uh, Eastern Java in the Surabaya and Malang area. So hence, there is less opportunity for us to take this and accelerate further in the Eastern part of um, Java. These findings are in particular important because they, they prove one is that even Greater Java Island, there's so much potentials. The collection capacity varied from regions and therefore they need interventions and support from various stakeholders to improve and to accelerate the, the development of circular economy. Now the stakeholders that we, we emphasize here are all of us, us as consumers, the government, the national government, the subnational government, us as businesses, and also the all the actors from the upstream, midstream, and also downstream. Okay, so if we look at this again, how we should use this data. One is, of course, we, we as Unilever, we would like to use this data to engage the national and subnational government to re become, to raise the awareness that there is a need to accelerate um, the recycling industry um, in Central Java and other regions with high potentials. But with these potentials, there are, comes opportunities for investments, local and foreign direct investments, job creation, sub-national revenues, clean water, clean air, and of course, clean environment. Next slide, Tazar. This is a very important slide. Uh, that we have uncovered. This slide, this slide it, um, speaks about the data of why we feel this is really important that we would like to share with Bapak Bapak Ibu Ibu Sekalian um, this afternoon. There are th two things to note from, from this slide. One is the total plastic collected right now in Java is just shy of 12%. Wow, of course, that means there are six, there is still 88% still being disposed into the land mill, into the land, or littered into the environment. There is an opportunity to collect 167 tons of plastics per month. Sorry, I think there's someone that needs to. 
Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just repeat that. So there is a, like I said, the total plastic collected right now in Java is just shy of 12%. That means that we have an opportunity of 88% to really push or for further um, recycle, further collection, further robust collection across Java. So there's an opportunity to collect 167 tons of plastic per month. That is per month. This is huge economic opportunity where if we do it right, it can bring domestic and foreign direct investments, job creations and clean environment. The second thing I'd like to note from this data is the total potential of downstream recycling capacity in Java. Right now it's almost at 27,000 ton per month. But if we, in, if we increase the collection, if we increase, let's just say that we increase the collection by 50%, we will have a substantial amount of tonnage of plastics that actually then gets recycled at the downstream end. The greater the downstream recycling industry, the greater collection, the greater downstream recycling industry, the greater acceleration of circular economy that we can bring to the country. This data complements um, the finding from previous researchers, such as by Putri et al. at uh, 2018 and Deloitte in 2017, that have calculated the amount of absorbed plastic by downstream actors using material flow analysis or MF MFA. However, those studies only focus in the big cities in Java, such as Jakarta and Surabaya. So what we've done is we looked at more cities in Java. Um, when we feel this is a more uh, representative data of what actually is um, out there in the market. Next slide, Tazer. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. The key points from this slide, um, again, are twofold. The total plastic consumption in the country is at 5.6 million ton. This will continue to grow as the country develops um, to become the fourth largest GDP in the world by 2045. So we can, pl we can plug that, uh, you know, uh, CAGR number into this number, and we can then exponentially calculate how much growth our plastic assumption will be by 2045. We should look at that as a huge potential, how, how we could really make better use of our plastic packaging. 70% of the plastic that are used right now is by using virgin plastics. This is a combination of domestic virgin plastic usage or, or, or production, but also 42% of imported plastics. Now, with 70% of plastic all produced by virgin plastic, it only means that only 30% are produced with recycled plastics. This comes from either post-industrial or post-consumer recycled plastics. The key potentials from this data is, again, two. <clears throat> One is for us to really push for a reduction of amount of imported waste or imported plastic. This would move the 1.6 million ton not from domestic version, but from the domestic recycled plastic, especially from post-consumer recycled plastic. Excuse me, okay. yes, three minutes left. Yes, second is as we grow a domestic recycling industry, we will also start to reduce the usage of virgin plastics. And this is key to accelerate the circular economy. Next slide. <laughs> okay, now in summary, um, I think, uh, most of Baba Babi probably have also read our, our uh, um, journal um, that the current rate of plastic collection is only at 12%, shy of 12%, with 88% still um, very much in uh, as an opportunity. Incentivizing um, the different plastic types is also key for us to really move the needle, to really move the, the materials there. <coughs> sorry. Now, less in the collection, but also move it to be a more of collected uh, amount as well. <coughs> Sorry. Now, the use of PCR could be improved by the increase of recycling demand, capacity, and its distribution, plus technology and application to process plastic waste. <coughs> Excuse me. Last slide. Now, how are we going to use this as Unilever? 
we use this to really set the priorities areas where we want to engage. When we feel like Central Java, of course, is very, very key, um, as our study have depicted. We also want to really be able to focus on the areas that we can move, we can make a difference, that we can, uh, with investments from our part and our stakeholders and our partners, that we can really move the needle to really accelerate the circular economy. Of course, circular economy of any acceleration will not be uh, effective if Unilever did it alone. So we are asking everybody here as well to form collaborations on how we can really develop this value chain to be a much more uh, robust and effective to produce an effective plastic one management system. Thank you, Dr. Ahya Yudin. That is all for me. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Nurdina Darus. I believe uh, discussing about the plastic waste uh, will trigger a lot of questions from the participant. Uh, but may I request that all of the participants who uh, want to raise question or comment, just fill in the form. Uh, the address is provided uh, on the chat room. And we will come to the QA uh, session after all of the three speakers uh, finish with uh, their presentation. Let's continue to the second uh, speaker. And second, second speaker will be conducted by Dr. Haruki Agustina. Before she start her presentation, may I resume uh, her uh, bi biography. Uh, Dr. Haruki Agustina, awarded Doctor of Environmental Science from uh, Universitas of Indonesia in 2015. Uh, she has a uh, lot of expertise and she has uh, specific expertise in persistent organic pollutants, POPS. And she is also expert in uh, 3R and environmental technology on waste management, environmental toxicology, industrial waste management, uh, eco concept, domestic waste management and technology uh, and carrying capacity. She is a member of uh, many uh, professional societies or organization. Here, I just uh, uh, want to mention uh, some. Uh, she is a member of Indonesian Environmental Scientists Association. She is also a member of uh, WHO, Temporary Advisor for the Task Force, member of the Regional Forum on Environmental and Health. Uh, she was uh, from 2003 to 2013 member of expert working group on environmental POPS monitoring in Asia Pacific region. And since 2003 till now, uh, she is member of Asia Network of Organic Recycling. Uh, she was also member uh, of technical team for the global environmental facility project with the title enabling activities to early action on the implementation of the Stockholm Convention on persistent organic pollutant in Indonesia. She attended a uh, lot of meetings, seminar and workshop uh, in countries and also in overseas. Here, I just want to mention some. Uh, she attended uh, the 3R forum in Asia Pacific region meeting 2017 in Mumbai, India. She attended a 3R forum in Asia Pacific region meeting 2016 in Adelaide, Australia. She attended a capacity building for sustainable waste management in the Asia Pacific region to promote eco town model. And she also attended the Asia Pacific workshop on global partnership in waste management in 2012 in Osaka. Actually, there are a lot here, but I think uh, I will not read uh, all the rest. Uh, okay, I believe, let's say, uh, it should be, let's say, enough for introduction. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Haruki. Dr. Haruki Agustina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Uh, everyone. It is an honor for me to join this JESSDUE symposium. In this afternoon, today I would like to uh, uh, share our uh, our database uh, based on uh, a government site on collaborative scheme of solid waste management based on Indonesian case study. Uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, 
Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, domestic solid waste uh, caught as a garbage is one of the most problem faced by all countries around the world, including Indonesia. Uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Aya, can you share the, uh, my presentation? Because I already shared my presentation. Okay, no problem. Dr. Our Aya. team will help you. Okay. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Please, Mr. So, Raja. Yes. Yeah. I just um, uh, while writing the my presentation, I will I will uh, uh, I will try to introduce what is the okay. situation yeah. right now on waste management in Indonesia. So the problem of solid waste management does not only in both environmental dimension but also social and economic di uh, dimensions. Indonesia is one of the country who has facing in solid waste management. Solid waste management in Indonesia. Uh, <clears throat> No, is uh, uh, we are facing on uh, solid waste management. The presentation, so the, uh, as a data based in our uh, in the Ministry of Environment. Mr. Ajar, could you help to share? Uh, as soon as possible, directly. Wait a minute. Yes, please help. Yes. Wait a minute, uh, Dr. Okay, Haruki. I will write. Yeah. Okay, better. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Mr. Ajar. Please, Dr. Haruki, you may continue. Yes, thank you. Okay, next uh, next slide, please, Azhar. Okay, since uh, domestic solid waste uh, called as garbage is one of the most problem faced by all countries, including Indonesia, the problem of solid waste management does not, not only involve environmental dimension, but also social and economic dimension. Indonesia is one of the country who has facing in solid waste management. So solid waste generation in Indonesia, as we can see here, uh, uh, is about uh, in year 19. You can see here, uh, the composition is more uh, domestic waste are content of organic waste about 57% and recyclable material is about 35%. If people understand what is the type they produce the waste, I think they can do separation from the source. It's uh, the main problem right now we're facing uh, in Indonesia. Only the rest, about 8%, I think waste can uh, manage by the local government. Next slide. So, uh, however, was uh, waste as a potential material between organic and unorganic waste, there are basic issues in waste management. First is a uh, lack capacity of local government. As uh, I will explain a little bit more about what is uh, the mandate of local government to manage the waste because under the, the, the law number 18, uh, waste management is uh, mandated by the local government. And also the second is uh, low public concern or public participation especially when they're changing the, the, the lifestyle and behavior to get the practices of a product with the more packaging, especially in plastic packaging. And also the trend of plastic waste composition now is more getting, getting higher. Uh, the last is import of scrap, mixed waste of hazardous waste uh, is a more coming problem for our government. This make more challenges in waste management in Indonesia. Next slide. See. I'm sorry, Miss Haruki, your voice. We can hear you. I think we lost her voice, Mr. Raja. Uh, I think we lost him, we lost her too. Okay. 
Uh, wait a second. You should continue on third speaker and then uh, continue again with the second speaker, Dr. Ahir. Okay, no problem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, uh, there is a technical problem that we lost a uh, connection with uh, Dr. Haruki. Uh, therefore, uh, we will uh, move to uh, the third speaker and after that, we'll come back again to the second speaker. So the third speaker uh, will be uh, is Dr. Wait one moment, please. Yeah, I want to. Okay. The set speech will be conducted by, by Dr. Yuki Wardana. And before he start uh, his presentation, may I introduce you first? Dr. Yuki Wardana, born in Sukabumi uh, in 1982. Uh, his formal education uh, taken for undergraduate studies was. Uh, from the conservation of forest resources in uh, University IPB in Bogor, uh, natural resources management in IPB for graduate studies, uh, magister degree, I suppose, and his doctoral degree earned uh, from University of Indonesia School of Environmental Science. Non-formal education that has been taken in the last three years is a green finance specialist from Renewable Academy Berlin, Germany, a public private partnership from Harvard Kennedy School and advanced financial model from University of Indonesia. His work, uh, he has extensive experience and here yes, I want to mention some as he has he was an environment and forestry specialist, lead auditor and technical expert of PT Sukopindo Persero from 2004 to 2014. She was a general manager of Cinemas Group, SCL Pulp and Paper, APP from 2014 to 2017. Non-permanent lecture at the School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia from 2014 till uh, present. She is senior, he is senior vice president of PT Penjaminan Infrastructure Indonesia, Prosero, from 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Dr. Yuki Wardana. Dr. Yuki Wardana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pak Ahya, Dr. Ahya. I will call my colleagues, uh, Mas Anger, can you show my presentation? Thank you. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Pak Ahya, for the thanks. And many thanks to committed to invite me. And it's an honor for me to be a speaker. And very special for me because I will present as academia and also practitioner in infrastructure. Today, uh, I will present about the alternative financing for waste management in Indonesia. And as we all know before, in terms of uh, waste management consists of three streams. Those are uh, upstream, middle stream, and the last is uh, downstreams. On the upstream, I think uh, I, uh, I very appreciate what uh, Unilever has done and a society that has a conduct a reuse, a reduce and recycle the waste. But uh, we also need to think about the end of process of uh, waste management. And next slide. Uh, I will present about the background uh, in my presentation with uh, three signs. In the red sign is uh, the problems and the yellow sign is it could be a problem or uh, opportunities and the green sign is uh, opportunities and according to Indonesia Bureau of Statistics or BPS until 2019 the population in the in Indonesia is uh, 200 uh, and uh, 67 million and still increasing on 1.07 
uh, rate per years. The huge population could be opportunity and problem, uh, of course, and the opportunity can be translated as strong capital to build or uh, problems. The huge population is potential market for producer uh, and thus it will uh, spur economic growth uh, for Indonesia. We know in economic concept that uh, industry will uh, uh, always uh, verging on population growth and back to its uh, population numbers, uh, problem will occur if there are no adequate infrastructure support. One of them is a waste management infrastructure. According data from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, the number, uh, the number of uh, waste in Indonesia in 2020 is around uh, 65.8 million ton per year. And I think this is a uh, keep increasing uh, uh, related to the populations. And the increasing number of population is also affecting uh, land ability, which in the end will uh, affect the scarcity of landfill ability for waste uh, management purpose. In Indonesia, uh, building uh, a landfill cannot be done in random uh, location uh, as it is sensitive to the society and needs to comply with a special requirement or RTRW. In the high density population city, there will be common issues uh, about the landfill scarcity. This uh, has already happened in, in some cities uh, like uh, Jakarta, Bandung, uh, Semarang, Jogja, and other places. Uh, and based on Indonesia regulation number 18 in 2008, the responsibility of waste management on the government and municipalities. Uh, and if we look on the perspective of the low, lowest uh, area, that, that is a regency or city, then the responsibility of that uh, waste management on their uh, administrative area, of course. There are uh, three constraints, uh, basically, uh, uh, that uh, currently occurs of uh, on the waste management in the district level. Those are, uh, the first is a fiscal constraint uh, approach uh, is 0.07%. Uh, I call this number is James Bond number, I think. And this is uh, relative to small because ideally it's around uh, three uh, until uh, four uh, percent uh, from uh, fiscal capacity. This is due to the limited fiscal capacity. Uh, and the second is technology, technology constraint. Due to small fiscal capacity, making the majority of method use is, uh, we know is a sanitary landfill that uh, affect the filing on landfill and potentially have a high detrimental effect on the, uh, on the environment. And the last, I think uh, related to what Abu Haruki mentioned before, about quantity and the quality of uh, human resources. We know the risk of waste management are relatively high and thus it needs to adequate quality and quantity of uh, human resources. Uh, basic, uh, based on uh, this constraint, I think uh, we need hope that the implementation, implementation of uh, alternative financing can overcome this constraint, including risk management. Uh, next slide, please, Mas Angger. Okay, we talk about alternative financing for waste manage management. Basically, alternative financing uh, used by uh, many countries to overcome financial and output uh, uncertainties. Uh, if I see, and according to the information uh, taken from the World Bank, uh, Greece has uh, implemented a PPP for uh, waste management. We all know about the turbulence in uh, economic in Greece, and according the, to the article, Greece is also encountered some problems. And financial problems that usually encounter when implemented uh, alternative financing for waste management, uh, based on a fiscal constraint uh, on building the waste management facilities. And the implementation of uh, alternative financing uh, could alleviate could alleviate the fiscal capacity through the increasing uh, waste value added of the waste, uh, the waste, such as uh, I think convert waste to energy, RDF, and other product. 
Uh, at the end on the slide, I will uh, be uh, explain about the implementation of alternative financing that is going to be used for uh, waste management in waste Java. Uh, output waste, the problem that uh, commonly encounter is that there is still lack of uh, output fulfillment in waste management, like conventionally managed waste management and still not adequate to standard and good uh, risk management. We all know that uh, the level of risk of uh, waste management is relative high. Environmental issues, mainly waste management, considered uh, a very sensitive issue to all uh, societies. Next slide. Uh, currently, uh, budgeting scheme of waste uh, in Indonesia, there are have uh, two budgeting scheme of waste management in Indonesia in the downstream level. The first is a stat, a state budgeting with a conventional government uh, or CGP scheme. I think this is uh, commonly used in Indonesia. Um, maybe uh, 95, 90 until 98 percent use this scheme for uh, waste management in Indonesia. And for the second scheme, this is a new scheme. Uh, basically, this is a new scheme uh, because uh, only one uh, project uh, use. Uh, public-private partnership scheme in Indonesia. I think, uh, as I know, it's uh, Nambu uh, West to Energy in Bogor. Basically, PPP is a long, a long-term contract between a public party and private party for the development and uh, or management of public asset or services. I will uh, underline the keyword. Uh, PPP is the. Uh, the private agents bears a significant risk uh, and management responsibility through the life of the contracts. And the uh, important with the scheme of uh, PPP is uh, re re remuneration is significantly linked to the performance and or the demand or uh, asset or services. Uh, I will show you uh, in the next slide about the how to manage uh, risk management in the uh, PPP. Before I will explain, uh, next slide, Mas Anger. Uh, I will, exp uh, I will uh, explain about the comparison of a CGP and PPP with uh, seven parameters. Uh, the first is source of fund, risk barrier, fiscal burden, um, business orientation, government support, investment return, control of asset. But uh, I will explain only three. Uh, three parameters, the big uh, three parameters. The first is source of fund. Uh, source of fund, uh, if we look the tables, uh, for CGP, uh, government has to fully pay according to development progress. I will show you the, the illustration uh, in the next slide. And for the PPP, 100% uh, uh, private sector or with the state-owned enterprise and the CAPEX, uh, capital expenditure is funded by the private sector or uh, SOE, not from governments. And the second uh, parameter is risk barrier. In the CGP scheme, in the CGP schemes, um, majority risk in the governments. I think it's uh, very risky if the the majority risk in the government. I will show you in the next slide. And the PPP, government or uh, private sector or both. Allocating uh, according risk allocation principle crucial is such as uh, DED operation and the uh, and the uh, maintenance in the uh, private sectors. And the last is the uh, fiscal burden, 100% for uh, CGP in the uh, in the government and for a PPP scam depends on its uh, government support uh, or. Uh, or uh, Guarantee. Next slide, Mas Anya. Yes, uh, this is a uh, risk management comparison between CGP and PPP. Uh, on this side, there is comparison between CGP and PPP scheme. On the CGP scheme in the left, uh, the majority of risks are on the public side or the government. We can look at the majority risk in the governments. The government has the responsibility of the first is land, 
uh, after that political design, finding, uh, maintenance, uh, life cycle, uh, facilities, abilities, performance, and asset uh, value. All the all the crucial risks on the waste management are on the public or government. We can show the PPP scheme uh, in the left, uh, in the green uh, sign. The majority of risk uh, waste management is borne by the private sector that has the experience and the technological capacity for waste management. Uh, the private sector will ensure uh, will compliance to the service level agreements because uh, the investor can get a payment is based on a service uh, provided. On PPP, public or government only manage uh, three rates. Uh, those are uh, land, political, and payment. I think this is uh, CGP and PPP is opposite, opposite uh, scheme. And based on this comparison, uh, I think my personal opinions, PPP is more effective on addressing those risks. Therefore, risk management or for waste management and will be uh, I will, will be explained on the next slides. And after that, uh, I try to comparison of CGP and PPP with Indonesia waste management constraint approach. Uh, I uh, I try to identify uh, the constraint of waste management in Indonesia. Those are the first is a uh, fiscal constraint. And after that, uh, technological constraint and limited human resources, services, and risk um, management. If we use the analytical, I think based on this, uh, based on the comparison above, PPP has much better implementation than CGP in Indonesia. For example, uh, fiscal constraint. For CGP, could uh, potentially deplete the budget. I think this is a very important and uh, basically this is char characteristic of uh, developing countries with uh, limited uh, fiscal capacity and a burden for a municipal city uh, with a fiscal constraint. And for PPP, the use of fiscal capacity during the partnership period and fiscal constraint can be hybrid, yeah, can be hybrid with business uh, from uh, waste management such as uh, FDF, such as uh, uh, electricity or gases, uh, I think this is uh, possible to implement in the PPP uh, scheme. And the second technology constraint uh, in the CG CGP is will be in accordance of the technology on the budget per year. I will uh, underline the, the keyword is refer to by, uh, budget or fiscal capacity. And the PPP side, Technology will be customized according to the target of the service level agreement. I will show you uh, in the uh, sample project in the West Java in the next slide. Next slide, Mas Angger. And I will identify of determine, uh, determining uh, CGP or PPP scheme. When mapping the scope of waste management in Indonesia then, and the alternative financing uh, structure, I will use schematic on the slide to the, determine the scope of uh, needs uh, on alternative financing. The first of all is fiscal capacity. If fiscal uh, capacity is adequate, the government can use CGP scheme. But other than if the value fair money uh, better for uh, PPP, uh, fiscal capacity can be uh, determined whether we want to choose CGP or PPP to determine the fiscal capacity to provide payment for the private sector in PPP implementation in Indonesia based on whether is fiscal support for the government. Uh, in the PPP scheme, it's possible to government uh, give uh, incentive uh, for uh, gap funding. If the payment for waste management is not available based on project needs and fiscal capacity, then uh, revenue stream will not only be from uh, tipping fee or biaya layanan pengelolaan sampah, but also derived from the waste management product such, such as uh, electricity. On the slide, it can be seen that income structure is also from the electricity. 
The second uh, parameters we need to identify about the quality and uh, quantity of waste. Uh, I think Bu Ade Barus uh, said uh, before uh, about the what important the quantity and quality of waste. Quality and quantity of waste is important to, important to determine the product uh, derivation for, from waste. Uh, for example, whether it's uh, electricity or other form, waste uh, remains the main component of the end product because the process product will be uh, the revenue stream to avoid reliance on uh, fiscal uh, capacity. And the third is uh, based on uh, quantity and quality of waste is set, then we can determine the produce output from the waste management. At least uh, in Indonesia for product of uh, proceed uh, waste according to the regulation, those are uh, compost, electricity, RDF, and gas. And other than from uh, we identification determining uh, CGP or PP scheme, we need to consider other uh, others, uh, factors. The first is environmental issues, uh, social and political issues. And the next slide, I will show you about illustration, how to uh, we use uh, CGP and PPP. The first in, uh, in the uh, picture is uh, in the right Just, uh, side. Three minutes left, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, in the red side is government budget expenditure. It can be seen from the graph uh, that uh, APBD or uh, state budgeting expenditure is needed for two list activities. The first is contractor uh, project contractors, and the second is for the operation and the asset. If we saw the graph of, uh, in the PPP expenditure of facility payment, we can we can separate. Uh, the budget in the long term in the contract. Uh, in PPP scheme, uh, within details as follow the, the first is construction cost. And after that, uh, during our operation period, we can separate uh, the operation cost. And the next slide, I will uh, show you about uh, waste management that using PPP scheme Indonesia in the West Java Logok Nangka. If we we look, uh, if we uh, see uh, the objective, one of the objective is there is 85% uh, efficiency of uh, waste treatment. And this number reflected to, reflected to the uh, surface. I think uh, we lost uh, the voice of uh, Dr. Yuki. Uh, probably it is a technical problem. So, uh, how about this, Mr. Angia? Can we come back again to? Okay, actually, uh, he saw the conclusion. Okay. But there is no yeah. voice from him. Yeah, that's the uh, problem. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. Actually, I th uh, I'm trying to contact uh, Yuki by now. Maybe he got uh, some problem with the connection, yeah? Okay, then so... Okay, could you so please? I will come back again to yeah, uh, yeah. Dr. Haruki first. Yeah. Okay, so I will stop uh, sure. Dr. Haruki, are you in already? Oh, conclusion. Yes, Pak Yuki. I, yes. Okay, okay. My, uh, last Pak, slide. Dr. Yuki is back. Okay, please, please okay. go to the conclusion. Sorry, yeah. problem, uh, my connection. To sum up uh, my presentation, we conclude that uh, the first of uh, my uh, research is uh, alternative financing is in waste management is needed to prevent the shock on the state uh, of uh, local budgeting. And the second one is other than fiscal capacity, there are uh, other constraints on waste management in Indonesia, those are technology constraints. And the third is alternative financing that is implemented has to be able to overcome those constraints on waste management. And the last PPP implementation on waste management could be utilized as one of 
effective alternative fencing method in Indonesia and could uh, potential overcome this constraint on waste manage management in Indonesia. Uh, I think uh, my presentation is finished. Uh, next slide, Mas Angger, this is a reference. And the last is thank you, pa Dr. Ahya, for the time. Uh, thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think so, the third topic is also uh, very interesting. And I believe it will, uh, let's say, come to the very uh, interesting discussion from the participant. But before we start the question and answer session, may I come back again to the second presenter, Dr. Haruki Agustina. Dr. Haruki Agustina, could you please continue your presentation? That was yes, thank you, Dr. Aya. Please apologize okay. me for uh, disconnecting uh, the signal. So uh, if I may have my presentation, please, uh, Mas Azhar. If you don't mind, please, maybe you can finish it in 10 minutes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so the from the waste management profile, uh, we can see here we still not need more improvement and public participation that still uh, the waste management is still leak of uh, the target uh, of 100% under the Jacksonas. There are people still uh, littering uh, the waste directly to the environment and also uh, open dumping site is a major uh, major uh, activities. Next slide, please. Uh, also, the trend of landfill process in Indonesia is still uh, uh, getting, uh, I mean, getting uh, better, but still uh, 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 below the 50%, the people, I mean, local government still uh, treat the waste management with the open dumping site. I think the factor is uh, 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 less budgeting and infrastructure in the, in the region. Next slide, please. Uh, also, uh, as uh, mentioned by uh, Unilever before, uh, past, uh, trend of plastic waste is uh, slightly increasing. Uh, as we can see here, we got the data uh, that is increasing uh, slightly. But when we, we, we try to estimate uh, until 2035, it will be uh, 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 increased uh, dramatically when no intervention like uh, what uh, has been done. Also, we also we also have a policy to have a restriction of plastic waste, and also we work with the producer to reduce the potential plastic waste from the product. Yeah, from the product with the uh, substitute raw material or uh, disposal dis, uh, disposal material. Next, please. So. Uh, uh, <coughs> This is confirmed that uh, uh, the public participation is still like in Indonesia. We need more uh, supporting to encourage people to do, I mean, to do separation from the source, make it easy to handle, I mean, to handle further the, uh, the waste from, from the household. Because 60% uh, waste uh, come from the household. Uh, uh, as I got a study conducted by Central Bureau of Statistics of Indonesian Environmental Indifferences Index, so people still do not want to do uh, to treat the waste from the from the sources. They don't want to do even separation and treat it it waste uh, in in the who uh, in the in the host. Uh, so far, uh, while they don't know which one uh, uh, organic and unorganic, since uh, uh, waste from the host no no separated, it will be uh, difficult for uh, further uh, management. Next slide, please. So if we can see here, what is the uh, government try to uh, to solve the problem? There are some uh, uh, regulation, policy, and roadmap under the presidential decree number 97. So we try to set up the policy and uh, uh, try to impart all stakeholders to join the, I mean, to involve uh, the waste management in, in, in Indonesia. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, Yuki said also, we also promote uh, waste to energy under the president presidential decree uh, number 75. So if we uh, if we do properly from the source, then waste can be treated in the proper manner and only 8%, uh, as I said before, goes to the landfill site or uh, thermal process. Next. 
We also promote a sustainable concept of waste management. We promote prevention of waste generation working with the producer, also limitation of waste generation working with the retail that uh, restricted of a single use plastic bag. We also promote reuse recycle with uh, working with the uh, recycle center, West Bank, and others. Even the waste picker, we call a uh, uh, waste picker. And also we promote waste to energy. Since we promote the presidential decree uh, uh, on num number 75 in 2019 uh, regarding the waste to energy, but no, still low since the since we don't have clear enough, but the, uh, where is the uh, uh, budgeting come from? Like uh, uh, Yuki already mentioned, there's some, some choices, but uh, local government still think how to operate the waste to energy alternative in, in their location. And the last is sanitary landfill, but sanitary landfill is uh, most difficult, most uh, uh, costly. We, uh, that's why we promote a uh, three uh, uh, process from of, with the waste management. Next slide, please. So uh, under the Jax Ranas, yeah, under the Jax Ranas, uh, we try the, we, we set up the policies, target, uh, even the program. Uh, this is such a roadmap uh, that Indonesia will face of the waste management uh, uh, to get uh, the goal 100% waste managed by 30% of waste reduction and 70% uh, uh, waste handling. So uh, we believe from if we waste we can uh, manage from the source, it can make easy more easier to handle uh, further uh, of waste management. Next, next slide, please. Uh, what is the collaborative program of waste reduction? This is the scheme that we try to create between uh, all, uh, all stakeholders, local government, public, producer, even the central government. So we set up the task and the function and uh, 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 and the function as uh, I said under the law number 18, actually for solid waste management is mandated by the local government, but it cannot be done by only with, with the local government is supposed to be supporting by the producer and also the government and public participation itself. Next slide, please. So uh, since we uh, we set up the, the, the goal, the, the called Jastanas, no more uh, regencies in Indonesia are uh, uh, are following the uh, set, set up the the policies of limitation single use plastic waste such a uh, one of the region in Kalimantan Banjarmasin uh, is one of a successful city who uh, who implement this uh, policy next uh, <clears throat> next so we also uh, uh, set up the roadmap of waste reduction by manufacturer yeah, by manufacturer. So uh, with the manufacturer, retail, and food and beverage, we uh, we we support uh, the manufacturer to 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 do some uh, some action to uh, to have less uh, less uh, potential uh, waste from the packaging of the product, like substitute uh, plastic uh, to be disposal. Uh, uh, the the more easy to dispose and aluminium, paper, and glass. So uh, like uh, food and beverage services, uh, some restaurant, cafe and hotel, catering, they know already uh, ban using the straw. Yeah, uh, this is some of them, uh, one of the example, uh, uh, what is the participation from the manufacturer uh, uh, sector? Next slide, please. Yeah, this is uh, such a, a waste reduction activities by manufacturing, replacing the raw material with the easy disposal. Also, uh, provide the facilities and tech back scheme. Yes, tech back scheme when uh, pasca consuming people can put in the some some location, some some dropping box to put to collect the to easy collect the, the plastic waste and bring it to the waste bank or recycle industry. Next slide, please. So. In terms of economic circular, when we uh, understand that waste uh, uh, has a valuable things, so we create some institution to 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 help government to manage the waste, like a recycling industry, waste bank, 
recycle center, even informal sector such uh, like scavenger or waste collector. Next slide, please. So uh, we promote, I mean, we promote and support uh, 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 West Bank recycle uh, facility, like we infrastructure uh, the building, we provide the, uh, the equipment to make uh, them easy to handle waste from, uh, from, from the source. Also, uh, we collect, uh, we, we, we create the waste-based data collection to get more information on waste reduction from the source. So also we give award to the waste bank who successful uh, to reduce the, to manage and reducing the waste from the source. Next slide, please. So in terms of economic circular, so uh, no West Bank is more scattered around Indonesia. No, it's uh, about uh, more than 8,000 West Bank are scattered around in Indonesia uh, with, the, with the bank uh, scheme. They do collect, they do teach people from the household to, to separate the waste between organic and unorganic. Organic goes to the industry, uh, recycle industry and organic make a composting. And also they, there's some advantage of economical perspective. One of the uh, one of West Bank in Indonesia can get uh, uh, advantage of, uh, of 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 money like uh, more than three billion IDR. So uh, next next slide, please. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, from the West Bank we can see what the public participation when. Uh, the public participates more and when the West Bank more and also people are joined with the West Bank more, they mean they mean uh, people uh, getting understand how to do uh, separation and check the waste to get uh, advantage and better uh, better treatment. So uh, from uh, from the West Bank, we try to to calculate uh, what is contribution of the waste reduction from the source, uh, like in your 20, in year uh, 2019, West Bank contribute 2.3 percent of waste re reduction from national uh, 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 generation of solid waste management. It is very potential to make West Bank uh, power uh, uh, more powerful to handle the waste from the source. Uh, the last, uh, the last slide, please. So. In conclusion, I believe waste management in Indonesia uh, should also be do by collaborative scheme and program with participation from all stakeholders, even government, local government, business sector, association, and community. Because uh, we, government need com commitment to issue the national policy to support waste management activity to achieve the national target waste reduction and waste handling in year 2025. Uh, 100%. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, we just finished with a presentation from uh, the speaker. Now we will come to the next session. This is QA for all of the speaker. And as I predicted before, uh, actually we got a lot of questions because uh, this is, uh, let's say, a virtual meeting. So we uh, didn't receive directly the question from the Please, this is unmute. Anas Esklik. Okay, yeah. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, we got uh, some question from the participant and you, uh, I will, let's say, uh, read it and then uh, I will mention to which uh, speaker this question is intended for. Um, okay, we start with, I think, the last presentation from Dr. Haruki about the collaborative, collaborative scheme here. This question about the collaborative scheme. Uh, how to streamline and synchronizing uh, the collaboration between uh, the government and the industry, especially for the plastic waste uh, that was, let's say, explaining by first uh, speaker, I think from uh, Ibu uh, Nurdiana. And I believe maybe it's also interesting to be answered uh, by Ibu Nurdiana, not only by Ibu Haruki. And the second question is for uh, Dr. Haruki is about the target of uh, reduced 30% waste in 2029. Uh, and the question from the participant is, 
we believe, or I believe here, uh, to reduce 30% is large amount, and it will be, let's say, involve uh, the social, technical, regulation, economic, uh, and everything. How do you see to manage this, let's say, again, uh, to reduce this 30%, because it's quite challenging. Uh, do you think that the innovative material should be, let's say, a solution? Okay, now I try to find another question also. Okay, I think it's also come to uh, Ibu uh, Mrs. Nurdiana. Uh, only small fraction of the plastic uh, could be recycled. Do you think that this situation need, let's say, uh, innovation from the material itself? And how, who is really responsible in this point? or how to, to manage the, the collaboration between industry and, and university to, to find new material maybe and so on and so on. Okay. And for uh, Dr. Yuki, here also I got a question, one moment please, because I have to, okay, here. Okay. PPP partnership, uh, as you explained on your presentation by uh, one example, is more dedicated to the small medium enterprises. And on the real, on the real business chain of this waste management, it will also uh, involve uh, many informal uh, sector. Do you think that uh, this PPP partnership uh, is only for small medium enterprises and how let's say the the financing the financing initiative for the informal sector on this business management and there is still i think one question one on please i have to check it okay uh, for Dr. Uh, Yuki, does the PPP have a risk that it could have a negative impact on the on the managing waste itself? I don't. There is no explanation about the risk here from from the from the participant, but maybe on 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 the on the business model, I suppose. Uh, yeah, there is. Does the PPP have a risk that it could have a negative impact on the business model? Okay, that's uh, all for the position. And please, for all of the speaker uh, to answer this question from the participant. Maybe we start with Ibu uh, Nurdiana or Ibu Haruki first, maybe I suppose. Okay, I will try to answer the question. Uh, how, how uh, in terms of collaborative scheme, how to synchronize with industrial sector? Uh, as I said uh, before, uh, to solve the waste management with the uh, uh, with the proper manner, we cannot do alone by the only by the government because there's some industrial sector who produce the product that to be a waste uh, pass uh, consuming. That's why uh, under the ministerial regulation, we have a roadmap of waste reduction by manufacturer. We we work together with the producer. So like a Unilever also, one of our member. I mean, to, we, we work together to uh, to get the uh, to find the solution. That's why, uh, as Ibu Ade said, they have a roadmap how to reduce uh, uh, the target, the, the waste, the potential waste from the from the product. So it is the uh, mean that we we do collaboration with the producer, even like manufacturer, yeah, food and beverage. Most are consumer uh, uh, product. Uh, second is retail. Retail also generate is a single use plastic uh, uh, bag that uh, only one 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 use and after that just throw to 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 the, to the bin. And the second is food and beverage services. So we invite them. We invite them. We synchronize our target and with the with the, the producer. Then we ask them to make a target to make a program how to reduce uh, to reduce the waste from this site. Yeah, like a uh, uh, some of industry has doing the uh, redesign uh, product, yeah, uh, redesign product. If you can see some product they, uh, of mineral water, they don't have any, uh, apa, any uh, uh, plastic, plastic 
and they don't they don't have plastic uh, wrap uh, in, in in on the top. It is it is such of a program that a producer can 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 reduce the potential waste because actually people people uh, consume the product from the producer. Then we try to to make a, from the start to the end. Uh, if uh, uh, from the start, I mean, from, from the producer to to try to uh, they have they, they to make a roadmap to reduce the, the the potential waste. And the second is how 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 do you manage the the uh, uh, target of twenty five percent operation in twenty twenty five? Under the Jastanas, we set up the roadmap between year per year until twenty twenty five. So uh, about the waste reduction, I believe this is uh, very hard. See, uh, uh, very hard since the people that uh, do, don't want to join. I mean, don't want to involve the the waste from the source. No, we educate. We cater. I mean, we 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 socialize uh, the program, the para change the paradigm, and also uh, make uh, some uh, uh, policy to restrict some some some. Uh, uh, some uh, plastic in some area. So it is such a quite uh, a successful. Then I believe if people and every stakeholder, if uh, put on attention and get um, a, a program together, I believe 25% in 2025 will, 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 will achieve. Uh, will achieve. Yes, as I told to you, West Bank is one of potential uh, institution from the grassroots uh, to manage waste from the source, they do separation and they educate people from host to host. And also uh, we built the uh, recycle center to make a connecting. We also connecting from the grassroots to the recycle industry. We still know doing on it, uh, uh, working with the, with the society, with the uh, industrial sector to get a link, to get the link, uh, uh, how to uh, finalize the waste when they do collecting and bring it to the recycle industry. Thank you. Okay, uh, please uh, continue, Mrs. Uh, Nurdiana. Um, thank you, Dr. Yahudin. Uh, let me just I let me just clarify the question again. Um, I think the question, the first question to me was how would a company such as Unilever align our programs with the government's plans? Is that right? That was the yes, first yes, question. Yes, 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 please. Yeah. So um, I have uh, mentioned the the commitment, the, the the global commitment of Unilever, but of course. When we do, when we implement these commitments, we have to align this with the government's plans as well. Now, uh, KL Haka, of course, and with uh, men, uh, the end of 2019, there's a, there's a roadmap that each company would have to develop in order to meet the 30% reduction um, by 2029, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then, of course, that is in conjunction with the government's commitment also to reduce the 70% of marine debris by 2025. So in a way, uh, companies such as Unilever, we've got three sets of commitments. One is the global commitment that we apply onto ourselves. The second commitment to uh, Permen KLHK. And then the third as well, of course, the, the, bigger, the bigger plan to be waste-free by 2040. Now, how do we do this? We have... Uh, we collaborate a lot. Uh, we discuss a lot with KLHK. Um, that's one. We also collaborate a lot among the companies as well, um, such as Unilever is part of Praise, that is a membership association of other um, FMCGs and uh, companies that are concerned about plastic waste management. And then we look at what we can bring um, to the table together as a collection of concern stakeholders and not only that we also talk to uh, the world bank as well and we talk to other financiers as well so these are the collaborations it's more than just one company alone that we need to um, or we need to push and these will definitely have to be aligned to the government's plan so that it can be it can then be adopted into not just the national government's commitment but also more importantly also at the subnational government commitment as we know that the the actors on the ground are actually you know the uh, the pemda the pemerintah daerah the kabupaten and the provinsi and of course they've got their own budgets as well that can then link into the 
um, the financing that Dr. Yuki mentioned as well. So that is where all the stakeholders, including the subnational government, including the NGOs and us as consumers will have to really be very conscious about how we manage our waste, our plastic waste from our home into our waste bank. And then how then we then also purchase what is good, which is products that contain recycled content, recycled plastic. Okay. Uh, sorry, but you didn't, uh, the next question was, um, can you repeat the second question? I think uh, the, the second question is about uh, the recycling. Only small uh, percents of the uh, waste uh, plastic could be recycled. And the question is how, let's say, to uh, invent in the future for this material where, uh, and whether it's uh, responsible for industry or also for government or for university? Because I think you mentioned on, on your slide here. Yes. So the small fraction of plastic that is currently recycled, is the, there, are, there are many, many aspects to that. But the most important aspect for, for us is to uh, ensure that the supply of the plastic. And then when we talk about the supply of the plastics is really beefing up our collection and processing aspect of it. So if we can collect more from post consumers, if we can collect more from household at source, good plastic that has not gone to the landfill that is then diverted straight from the house onto the collection site, whether that's TPS3 or TPS3, then we can then bring those good quality products, good quality plastics, and then they would be more worth even more in terms of economy. Why is that? Because clean plastic, then does not need to be cleaned so much. Now, uh, now at the moment, the cost for to clean the plastics is very huge. And I think this is one of the cost element that if we work together, so the subnational government, the NGOs, us as consumers, if we are able to really ensure that the collection of plastics actually happens at source, it then gets onto the recyclers still in good, pristine quality, clean plastics, that can really, one, decrease the price in cost of cleaning the plastics. Second, then it retains the good value of the plastics. So when it's a, it's a good value of plastics, then it generates better economy for all the stakeholders, so all the players, from the pomulum, from the waste pickers, to the aggregators, to the as recyclers, and also then it's a better for the economy as well. We then do, we will then generate a lot more robust, a lot more professionally run downstream recycling industry. So yes, and I believe the, um, the universities will, will have to play a really huge role in innovating the plastics, the recycled plastic and how universities and academicians and researchers will have to really help us in designing what would be the mechanism to really solve the collect and processing issue but also really be innovative in creating the materials that is recyclable or compostable or reusable. Get to Pak Yudin. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Nubriana. Now come to Pak Dr. Yuki. Please, Dr. Yuki. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, uh, I think the first question is a PPP considered more delicate to be implemented and in real business case, it. Uh, related a uh, lot of business sector. Uh, if it is uh, applicable for SME, uh, basically if uh, we, uh, we, uh, we have decision to implementation PPP or CGP, the first of all, uh, we need to calculate the value for money. Uh, where the, the scheme is the best uh, for uh, waste management in the municipalities. For example, uh, if the CGP scheme is uh, uh, CGP scheme is uh, very effective, and the local government can uh, can prepare the budget for the waste management, we can use uh, CGP. But uh, we know uh, PPP is an alternative financing for infrastructure project, uh, which is, uh, usually require a large capex. If uh, I mentioned before in the uh, in the 
Legok Nangka uh, Waste Management has a capex uh, 200 uh, million uh, uh, US dollars and and has a limited commercial parameters income and profit uh, expectation because uh, most of the sector uh, are held to fulfill basic needs and for projects that still have a high commercial value and affordable investment uh, can be run through b uh, b2b basis and for the second question uh, does he, uh, ppp uh, has risk that could give a negative impact on a business model for waste management. I think the presence of a PPP in the waste management sector is to optimize potential risk to the most capable parties. I think private parties has a good knowledge for technology and has a, has a capital for develop the project. Uh, as I explained in the case study, one of the uh, most uh, crucial risks from the government is the land and political, like uh, such as a uh, change in law, government action and inaction, and fix a minimum uh, volume of feedstock. Uh, I think this is uh, the PPP scheme will, uh, will give a positive impact for the model of uh, waste management. Thank you, Pa. Ayat. Okay. Uh, as we uh, predicted in the beginning of the session, uh, we believe that all the topic will uh, get a lot of attention from the participant. Uh, actually, uh, here on my desk, I have still a lot of questions, but uh, the time is already <laughs> uh, ends, and then I'm uh, send a question. For, all of the participants who already submitted question and not answered yet by the speaker, we will communicate to them. We will pass your question to them, to the uh, speaker, and we expect that uh, you will get answer by email. Yes. So again, as the moderator for this session, I would like uh, thank you very much for all of the speaker for the uh, interesting discussion, thank presentation, you. and you. answering oh, yeah. the question from the participant. For all of the participants who attend this meeting, uh, it's amazing, you know, I and mean, then during the, all of the limitation, we got a bit problem, technical problem during the session, but we survived, Alhamdulillah. So now I hand uh, again the session to be led by uh, Mrs. Putri Alferniera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Dr. you very much, Dr. Aya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayahuddin Sodri and all the keynotes. It's very interesting topics and discussion. Hopefully we can make it as a learning experience and hopefully the presentation will be beneficial for all the participants. Now, before we come to the end session, I will inform you to join our session tomorrow on 30 September 2020 on 7.30 a.m. Indonesian time with the special issues about cutting edge research on earthquake and tsunami monitoring and mitigation. This event is collaborate with BMKG Center for Research and Development. For this session, we have four keynote speakers who are expert in their fields by Professor Dr. Insinyur Wijojo Adi Prakoso, MSc PhD, from Faculty of Engineering Universitas Indonesia, Dr. Karen Lit Go from Earth Observatory of Singapore, Walter Dimuni, PhD from US Geological Survey, and Dr. Supriyat Norohadi from Center of Research and Development BMKG, Indonesian Agency for Meteorology, Climatology, and Geophysics. The keynote speech will be moderated by Raldi H.S. Kostur, PhD APU from School of Environmental Science, Universitas Indonesia. The link registration listed on the chat box. Ladies and gentlemen, finally, we come to the end of the presentation. We would like to say thank you for all keynotes with their informative and exciting discussion. Also, we thank, we thank you to all participants for your active participation. We, lastly, we would like to thank Bank Republic Indonesia, Unilever, and Starborn for sponsoring this first Journal of Environmental Science and Sustainable Development Symposium. Now we ask all keynotes and participants to turn on the camera because there will be photo session.
Okay, okay. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. One, two, three. Okay, next slide. Wait a minute. One, two. It's okay if you don't have any camera. One, two, three. Okay, next slide. One, two, three. The other one, two, three. Okay, done. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for thank your you. attention. We hope you are all keeping safe wherever you may be. And all the participants are allowed to leave the group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahya. Thank you very much. 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 Th